I'm going to tell you a story about the most ridiculous adventure. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about all the failings, small and big, that kind of culminated um, in, in us getting there and actually getting to the end of it. It all started a few years ago with me, my two buddies, Lee Purnell and John O'Ellison, thought it would be funny to drive a London black cab from London to Sydney. Uh, we were doing this, we wanted to break the world record for the longest ever taxi journey. We wanted to raise some money for charity as well, for the British Red Cross. Um, we couldn't find a cabbie to take us, nor could we afford the fare if we wanted to. So uh, we went to the next best place, uh, eBay, where we picked up Hannah, a 1992 fairway driver. Uh, she cost us 1,300 quid and only had 300,000 miles on the clock before we started. So we were pretty confident we were going to be all right. This is us looking pretty fresh-faced. Uh, we set off in February 2011 from Covent Garden, um, headed off into Europe and headed north. Uh, briefly had a bit of a heating failure and found ourselves up in the Arctic Circle after a few weeks. And any of you who know a bit about maps can tell that this is not the best way to get to Australia. Um, the reason why I did this was because, we, again, we thought it was funny to see if we could go there via the longest route possible, like all good taxi drivers do. Uh, <laughs> the other thing you may have guessed is we did plan this in the pub. Um, so, but it was cool, you know, we were out there at Arctic Circle, we got to see the Northern Lights, we met Santa Claus. Uh, we headed off into Russia, where we were promptly thrown in jail. A little bit of uh, persuasion meant we got out of jail, headed down south into Europe, where our next problem faced us. Our plan was we were going to go, again, longest route possible, through North Africa and the Middle East. Unfortunately, uh, the Arab Spring happened, and we had to change our plans. We went down through Balkans into Turkey, when we started to get some car failures. Um, a few of these later, and uh, we popped our way up into Georgia, where we suffered absolute liver failure. From there, back into Turkey, and headed down to Iraq, where we had a bit of a parking failure. Actually, this picture here is uh, one night we went to bed and uh, woke up to find a bazaar had been built around the car. <laughs> it had become a structural and integral part of the bazaar. So we've, we bought a few of the goods and eventually had to get out. I tried to blend in. Um, and then we headed over the mountains into Iran, an absolutely beautiful, stunning place uh, where uh, the presentation's gone in front of me. <laughs> and then there we go. And then um, basically we got into a little bit of trouble with the secret police. From there, we headed down into uh, Pakistan. Pakistan, we just about survived it, uh, into uh, India, where we, uh, we, we hit the monsoon and suffered a few more breakdowns. Uh, I physically broke down with a nasty case of dysentery. Uh, we saw some sights. Uh, we broke down again. Um, and then we broke down again. And then we broke, oh, then the wheel fell off, uh, which you don't want to do. Again, you need four wheels to drive. It's not the best kind of thing. Um, from there, we uh, went up north into Nepal, where the whole car came apart. The chassis, the bodywork, they, they loosened up. They'd rusted to pieces. Who'd have thought a car with 300,000 miles on the clock would do that? But uh, we welded her back together, and we headed up into the Friendship Highway into Tibet. The reason we wanted to do this here was because we wanted to become the first and probably only black cab to make it to Mount Everest Base Camp. Uh, that's a picture there of the taxi and Mount Everest. And don't be fooled, Mount Everest is bigger than the car. Um, but we made it. Everyone told us we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. No, it's impossible. Two-wheel drive car, you'll never make it. And after 100, 100 miles off-road, uh, we kind of agreed with them, but we just about struggled through, and we made it up into Tibet, carried on going through into China. And the interesting thing about China, to drive there, you actually need a Chinese driving license, which we managed to get. Yes, we passed a Chinese driving test. <laughs> then we managed to break down, uh, and then we did some more driving, and then we broke down. Um, and then we headed down into Laos, where we got stuck in a landslide, and um, into Cambodia, where we took some lovely pictures around some lovely stuff. Now, this is... This was a pivotal part of the expedition, because we were running out of money. In fact, running, we had run out of money. And uh, we weren't going to make it to uh, Australia. We had no way of doing it. So we started going around ringing, trying to find some sponsors to actually fund us to keep on going. Problem is, um, none of them would do it. And then out of the blue, a company who just got a load of money uh, got in touch with us and said, hey, we want to sponsor you, not just to drive to Sydney, but to go the whole way around the world to London. And we thought about this for at least a second or two, and we said, hell yeah, this sounds like a great idea. We got the car, we crossed out Sydney, we put London underneath there, <laughs> drove down through all the way, put the car in a shipping container, shipped it to Australia, our original destination. See, there's a kangaroo, you can tell that's Australia. Um, drove across the outback. We got a car fixed in Cairns by a guy who would later become Australia's most wanted for killing his customers. Two people, uh, not us, we bought him beer. Um, got to Sydney, put the car in another shipping container, shipped it to America. 
Now, as you see, there's another car. Another car joined us, but a little bit before this picture was taken, we had, um, we had a bit of a problem. And that was, Customs had decided that they wanted to search our car and make sure that everything was fine. And we were like, this is cool, no, this is fine, you can search it. And then they said, okay, well, this is going to cost you thousands of dollars. And we were like, well, you found nothing wrong. They said, yeah, well, storage will cost you thousands of dollars. We weren't cool with this, obviously. We hadn't done anything wrong. We didn't want to have to pay for that. So we um, broke into the warehouse. We stole the car back. It was now ours. We owned it in the first place. We drove across America, ate some burgers, uh, shot some guns, and uh, managed to make it all the way to New York without anyone noticing. We got away with it. <laughs> Or so we thought. This is a copy of a newspaper. It's called the Wall Street Journal. It's uh, one of the largest in the world. On the front page, you'll see an article about three guys in a black cab. Could be anyone, right? There you go. There's a picture of our black cab, just in case you uh, were going to miss it. Nice and zoomed in. Uh, we obviously had to get out of there. So we flew the car to Israel, where we had to do some press stuff with our new sponsor. We took a few uh, photographs. And then we headed up into, uh, towards Greece. Again, another problem. Uh, the, when we shipped the car to Israel, they lost our car passport. And this is kind of integral for getting between the borders. So we, we forged one. Um, it worked all right. Getting in the, Gre the Greeks didn't notice it too much, nor did any of these other countries until we got to Moldova, when they said, hey, these are forgeries. We said, no. <laughs> and they said, no, this is a photocopy. <laughs> and we were like, all right, fair enough. Can, can we get in? They said, no. And we were stuck in no man's land. There was no way we were getting out. So we, we didn't know what to do. We, we called a few people, and they spoke to someone else, and they spoke to someone else, and then they spoke to the president of Moldova, who gave us a pardon. The first thing he did, one of the first things he did as he got into power was to pardon us for not having the right documents and let us into the country, which we were quite chuffed about, and we celebrated, like you would, by racing a vintage Russian Volga, Volga taxi for Moldovan Top Gear. <laughs> That's us winning. From then, headed up north, again, the longest route possible to our old friend Moscow. And from Moscow, we took the long route back to London, where we wanted to get to. We got here. Uh, we had driven 43,000 miles. Um, we had raised 20,000 pounds for the Red Cross. Uh, we had broken two world records, one for the longest ever taxi journey and one for the highest ever taxi journey. And we'd racked up a fare of 80 grand to get us there. We even got invited to take part in the Olympics closing ceremony. So if anyone remembers it, do you remember the Spice Girls dancing on top of black cabs? You know the guy who was driving them? It wasn't me. Um, I was the guy who was driving a cab in front of them. Yeah. All right, it was not quite as good as it sounds. But you know, we haven't got a huge amount of time. I've got, I've got to tell you three stories about how the whole thing almost failed. Um, but I've only got time for one. So I'm going to tell you the three failures, and you have to shout for the one you want the most. They are basically financial failure, deportation from a rogue state failure, and political failure. So who wants to hear about financial failure? <laughs> deportation from a rogue state? <laughs> how about political failure? OK, that's great. I'm not going to lie, there's only two buttons on this. I thought you might say that. <laughs> It'll take you to Iran. So Iran was an absolutely stunning, beautiful place filled with amazing people. Uh, we were driving through it. We had to get from there into Pakistan. Problem is, two of us didn't have our Pakistani visas. And um, we were desperately trying to get them. We found out that we could actually get them if we went to Dubai. And uh, the problem is, the car couldn't go through with one of the guys without me being there, because it's in my name. So I had to get this visa. And so we were hot footing it through around one night. Um, we decided to pull over across the motorway. We're in the desert. It's deserted. It's in the name. Um, and we pulled off. We just parked. It was pitch black. It was fine. There was nothing there. And we went to sleep. The next morning, I woke to a sound nobody really wants to hear when they're camping. When my mate went, is that an artillery gun? <laughs> He was absolutely right. It was. It was quite a big artillery gun. We've been woken up by some guys with big AK-47s, but this gun was big. It doesn't look very big there. Here's a zoomed-in picture. That's a big gun. That's another big gun. This is not the kind of place you want to be in Iran. So we, we tried to get the hell out of there. We packed everything up. We were just getting out of there, and then the police turned up, and then the secret police turned up, and it all went downhill. Um, effectively, we eventually actually argued our way out of it. I mean, basically, we, could click. we were clearly not spying. I mean, it's not the most subtle vehicle in the world. <laughs> but when we actually got out of that, I flew to Iran. I got my Pakistani visas. This was a great thing. The whole thing was pivotal. We almost lost it. So I flew back into Iran. This was great. The expedition was going to go ahead, because if we couldn't get into Pakistan, we have to go through Afghanistan. And that wasn't going to happen. 
So I was, this is, we were actually doing it, we were making it, and I flew in and I landed, and they, oh, yeah, I got there, and they're like, oh, ooh, no, 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 oh, get out, get out. I got deported for some reason. My passport had been flagged, probably because we camped in an artillery field, um, and uh, there was no way we could get it across. We did, though. Uh, my buddy gave it a go. We, th we thought, why don't we just try something? We'll just give it a go. You know, they may not look too hard, and they didn't. We managed to get through the Baluchistan Desert, one of the most dangerous areas in the world. We had an armed guard the whole way. This is our guard. And this is some more of the guards. Yeah, lovely. Um, and actually, we flew into Pakistan, met him in the car. We got in blending in there nicely. And we made it out. Yes, finally. However, this is, this is kind of a typical kind of problem you'd have along the way. There's failures the whole time. And uh, we were basically uh, trying to have to fix them, because if we didn't fix them, uh, we wouldn't go any further. This is a typical one. We're in Laos, and our uh, brake completely fell apart. And there's not like we have spare parts. There's not like a local guy who has you know, brakes for a 1992 FX4. Um, so we had to fix it, or we stay there. And if we did stay there, then the whole expedition would be a failure and spend the rest of our lives in Lao in the jungle. Um, and so what we did is, we, in this case, we actually uh, got the part, we cut up an old Coke can and put it in, and it managed to hold it together. We actually did another um, thousand miles with it. When we got back, I, uh, I started a business called the Daredevil Project. And what we do, we've done um, new kind of events where people have to do a load of tasks and, um, on a night out, and it's tons of fun. But, uh, Basically, we think it's going all right, you know? Um, people, people seem to like what we do. Um, you know, we've even made an app, which is kind of what everyone needs to do in this day and age. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd say so, but, you know, is it a success? Absolutely not. Good God, no. Up till now, it's just been failure after failure after failure. Everything is going wrong. We've had events have to be canceled. Pull this. It's terrible. This isn't going. And you know what? To make it even worse, Apple haven't approved our app. <laughs> but, is it a failure? Not yet. It's not a failure yet. It could be, but it's not there yet. Um, basically, you know, we may have to adjust our plans sometimes. You know, I'm not planning to fail, but sometimes things don't go to plan. I mean, we only planned to uh, drive to Australia, and, and had we not run out of money, we uh, wouldn't have managed to get this sponsor. We wouldn't have driven the whole way around the world. On the very first night of the expedition, uh, our Dutch couch surfing host told us not to worry about these things. He told us that you don't need to worry because you never get any good stories when it all goes to plan. <laughs> Thank you very much.